Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In him and him alone is the real gospel. In him alone we have real faith. In him alone we have real victory. The National Football League recently completed its annual draft. Uh, those new guys are now with their respective football teams. They're working out. They're learning uh, the system for the team. And before you know it, August will be here. And as many of you know in the NFL, uh, August means what? Yeah, it means preseason, right? Uh, the first games that they actually uh, have full contact with another team are preseason games. Four preseason games that typically take place in the hot month of August. So this August we get to look forward to the Dallas Cowboys playing the 49ers, the Bengals, uh, the Cardinals, and, and the Houston Texans. Now these games of course are designed for coaches to evaluate the new players to see whether or not they're worth keeping and for those new players to showcase their skills and hopefully make the final cut. But of course in these preseason games, uh, the veterans, you know, those players that we're most interested in, what happens to them? Well, they don't get to play very much, do they? They don't play very much at all. Why? Because these preseason games, they don't count. They just don't count. If you're a baseball fan, you all know about spring training games in Major League Baseball. These games ha happen in late February and throughout the month of March in the sunny, warm uh, states of, of Florida and Arizona. Arizona and Florida, those are the places you want to be in late February and early March. Uh, spring training games, uh, well, like preseason football games, uh, they don't count either. They don't count in the standings. They're just spring training games. They're warm-up games. And coaches use those games to evaluate newly signed players and the veteran players, the players that we're really excited about seeing and, and want to watch. Well, they don't play very much. So in preseason and in spring training games, when you win, you don't really win. Uh, when you gain the victory, you don't really gain a victory. When you beat your opponent, you don't really beat your opponent. And why is that? Well, none of these games really count. Have you ever felt as though your life is kind of like that? You know, kind of like a, a, a preseason game or a, spree, a, a spring training baseball game? Uh, there are times when we feel as though our lives are are very much like that. You know, we work so hard, we work so hard for something, and then we, we finally get it, and almost right away it sort of loses its luster. There are times when we work so hard for something, we, you know, uh, we get through school and we get that first job, we get that promotion, we get that house, and, and once we achieve that victory, uh, we feel as though, well, it's, it's kind of like you know, dust in the wind. I mean, at the end of the day, sometimes life can seem pointless, meaningless. We're all looking for, for something that has more substance to it, something that is lasting. We're all looking, you know, whether we realize it or not, we're all looking for real victory. Real victory. So I've got some good news for you, some very, very, very good news for you. Today, the last Sunday of the Easter season, we come to the end of this six-week sermon series on 1 John that we've called Real Faith. Real Faith because throughout his five-chapter letter, John contrasts what is real and what is fake, what is the genuine article, the real deal, and, and, and what's fraudulent and phony. And today, John offers real victory, not fake fake and phony and fraudulent victory. Of course, we all, we all know about that. Uh, like when you've, you've landed that job uh, of your dreams and two years later it turns out to be a nightmare. Uh, like when you're at the 26 mile mark of, of that marathon called a career and the company that you poured your sweat and blood into goes belly up. Uh, or, or you work so hard uh, to make that team only to make the team and ride the bench all season long. We all know what those sort of victories taste like and feel like, fake 
and phony and fraudulent victory. Preseason, spring training. It's in that context that John guarantees us ultimate, lasting, permanent victory. Let's see what he has to say. He says, first off, that we have, we have the victory. Victory, uh, of course, is the word of the day. Victory in Jesus. John begins, if you have your sermon notes with you, John begins, everyone born of God has the victory. There's the word of the day. I have it there in Greek for you, in green italics, Nike. Uh, Nike. Uh, you all thought Nike just sold athletic gear, right? Uh, long before that Nike, there was this Greek word, Nike. Nike is the Greek word for victory, triumph, winning. And John uses this word, Nike, four times, four times in two verses. Everyone born of God has the victory over the world. This is the victory that has the victory. Now, I know that sounds a bit odd to you, that sentence structure there, kind of wooden. It's my own uh, translation of John's Greek text, and I, I did that so that we can see the number of times that John uses that word, Nike. This, this is what he says. This is the victory that has the victory over the world, even our faith. Who is it that has the victory over the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So, three out of the four times that John uses this word Nike, this word victory or triumph or winning, in these verses, three out of the four times it appears as a verb. Has the victory. Has the victory. Has the victory. Those are verbs. And they are present tense verbs. And that's a big, big idea. John doesn't, he doesn't use a past tense verb and says, you had the victory. John doesn't use a future tense verb, you will have the victory. No, it is present tense. Has. Right now, in hand. This is a present possession. It is a habitual victory. It's an ongoing triumph. In other words, John says that we are invincible. We are unconquerable. We have the Nike. We have the victory. How many of you woke up this morning feeling like you had the victory? You probably didn't feel this way at all. In fact, most of your life, you probably don't feel this way. I mean, you feel as though you stumble and fall. You sort of catch yourself occasionally uh, thinking those, those wicked thoughts, uh, speaking those wicked words, doing those wicked actions. Why? Because we're all sinners, right? We all stumble and fall many, many times a day. But that doesn't change what John writes. Present tense. Has the victory. Victory in Christ is not temporary. It's not an event or any, an occasion. Victory in Christ is a lifestyle. It's a state of being. Victory in Christ is not something that we do. It's something that we are. It's a permanent state, never to be altered. And this was a stunning claim that John makes in his world. You see, in the worldview of John's day, uh, people didn't believe that, that they could ever have victory. Nike, this Greek word, was never used uh, of people. In fact, Nike was used for a goddess. If you know your Greek mythology, you may recall that Nike was a goddess. She was the goddess of victory. So only the gods and the goddesses could have victory could have triumph. Only the gods and goddesses could actually win anything. And, and people, well, in the worldview of First John, people could never experience real victory. That was reserved for the gods and the goddesses. So it's within that worldview that John says four times, four times in two verses, we have the victory. St. Paul says the very same thing. One of the most famous verses in the Bible, Romans chapter 8, verse 37, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I want to focus on a couple of words uh, in this verse. The first one is that tiny little word in. What's the big deal with in? 
Well, let me tell you, this is, this is a very realistic verse from St. Paul. It's very realistic about living in our sinful, fallen, broken, and messed up world. You see, Paul doesn't say, he doesn't say around all of these things. Uh, somehow you get around uh, these things in your life. Paul doesn't say that, that you go over all of these things. He doesn't say you dig under all of these things. No, it is in it. It's right in where you are. It, it, it's in our muck. It's in your mire, in your mud, in your mayhem. I am a victor in spite of my surroundings. In it all, not around, not above, not under, in tiny little word, huge preposition. In all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors. Again, the Greek word here, uh, hyper And Hyper, everyone knows what hyper is. You've all seen a uh, three-year-old before. Hyper means uh, supreme. It means ultimate. Hyper Nikomen. You see uh, in the word a little bit of Nike. We are hyper Nike people, ultimate victors, extreme conquerors, invincible, unconquerable as children of God. That is what you are. That's what Paul says. We are more than conquerors through him. That's Jesus, through Jesus who loved us. So even when you, even when you are in it all, when your body breaks down, that, that job that you want it, it goes to somebody else. Your marriage goes by the wayside. Your kids don't listen to you. Your alarm clock doesn't go off. Your car breaks down. You have a terrible, horrible, no good, rotten day in it all. We are hyper Nike people. That's what John teaches. That's what Paul teaches. John doesn't stop there. He goes on. Victory over what? Victory over the world. The same two verses here. There's a lot in them. We looked first at the word Nike. Now I've highlighted this three-word phrase, has the victory over the world. That's the victory. That's the victory. It's not over, it's not over the government, right? It's not over the, the New York Yankees or the Philadelphia Eagles. The victory is over the world. So what is the world? Well, for St. John, in all of his writings, world, it doesn't mean the globe. World doesn't mean uh, civilization. It doesn't mean society. World doesn't mean uh, people. World, for John, means the world system, world values, uh, the definitions that the world gives to happiness and, and, and success and the good life. For John, the world is a sick system. It is a system that is dominated by Satan. Uh, living in darkness, opposed to Jesus. For John, the world is a system that is hell-bent on greed and idolatry and jealousy and hatred. And John uses that word world throughout his five writings in the New Testament. World for John means a system that offers you victory, but in the end only delivers defeat. It, it's that world that wants to steamroll you and destroy your faith in Jesus. It's that world that is opposed to everything that we proclaim and do here in this church. It's that world that wants to level us and destroy us. It's that world, John says, that you have victory over. Imagine, if you can, the biggest enemy of all, the hugest enemy of all, there is victory over that world. And you're probably asking how, right? How? Well, John goes on, and he says to us, this victory is through faith. Faith. I think we might understand that a little bit, don't we? It's not, you see, it's not our battle uh, to fight. I want to repeat that because most of you probably think a bit like me. You know, you're, you're out there fighting battles and you, and you think, if it's going to be, it's all up to me. I got to fight this battle. It's all up to me. No. No, it's not. You heard this great verse in the Old Testament reading this morning, 1 Samuel 17, verse 49, where David says, the battle belongs to the Lord. Whatever it is you're fighting, it is finally his battle. 
So we have the victory over that world through faith, not by anything that we do, but by what God has done. Victory is certain because the victory is God's. Now this time in these same two verses, so we're going to highlight that word faith. This is, the, this is the victory that has the victory over the world, even our faith. Who is it who has the victory over the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith. Christian faith. Not a feeling. Christian faith is not a hunch. It's not a guess. Christian faith isn't something that we sort of cross our fingers and just hope that everything turns out well. No, Christian faith is based upon fact, substance, historical events. Let me put it this way. Uh, let's say you're out one day hiking with a group of people and you come across one of those, you know, uh, those wobbly wooden bridges extending over a deep, wide canyon. Now, if you're like me, you're going to have your 13th nervous breakdown. If you're anything like my daughter, Hannah, well, well she would probably dance and, and skip right over that bridge. She's not frightened of anything at all. But me, if I were confronted with such a bridge as that, I'm going to move across it inch by inch gingerly, you know, fearfully. But the only way to get to the other side is this rickety, wobbly, wooden footbridge that's suspended 100 feet above the canyon floor. Now, you've got to have faith in that bridge, right? If you're going to actually do this with your group, you've got to have faith in this bridge. You've got to believe that this bridge is going to get you across to the other side, and if you get across, it's not your belief... <laughs> that got you across, it's the bridge. So I can have a little faith in a strong bridge, or I can have a lot of faith in a weak bridge and, and fall to my death. So here's the point. Faith is, is only as good as the object of that faith. Your faith, my faith, is only as good as the object of faith. So. What's our object of faith? What's going to get us across to the other side? John answers that for us very clearly in verse 5. He says, who is it that has the victory over the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the bridge that gets us across, finally, from death to eternal life. Jesus is the Son of God, and He's also God the Son. He's the, the promised Messiah. He is the root and offspring of David. He is the bright morning star. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. It's Jesus who is the Son of God. That's the bridge. And faith is only as good as the object of our faith, and you can count on Him. He is the Son of God. At his baptism, the Father declares Jesus what? Son of God. At his death, a, a Roman soldier declares Jesus what? Son of God. In Romans chapter 1, verse 4, it says at his resurrection, Jesus is declared what? Son of God. Get it? Our faith is not in faith. Our faith is in the Son of God, baptized, crucified, and risen. So we have the victory, John says, over the world through faith. How do we experience it? How does God bring this to me? Do I have to go up to him to get it? John says no. He says this victory is delivered in the means of grace. This victory, John says, is delivered. Uh, delivered right where you are, right where I am, just here, you know, just now. We can't go up to get it. So God brings it down to us through the means of grace. What do I mean by that? Well, we can look at the next couple of verses. John helps us to understand. He says, this is the one, uh, he's talking here about Jesus, the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. What's that all about? Uh, think back 
Jesus on the cross, John chapter 19, verse 34, where this Roman soldier took a spear and thrust it into our Savior's side. What came out? Uh, John says, a sudden flow of blood and water. So here John is talking about, he's referring uh, to the death of Jesus. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, and it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. The Spirit, water, and the blood. What's John doing? Water and blood, the first and second times there, refer to the death of Jesus. The third time here, water and blood are used uh, along with the Spirit. Uh, John is pointing us to the means of grace. The means of grace, what are they? Well, water, uh, you get that. That's water refers to holy baptism. Blood, of course... Blood, of course, refers to the blood of Christ and the Holy Communion. The Spirit it refers to the Spirit-inspired Word of God. So here in 1 John chapter 5, verse 8, he's teaching us that the victory achieved by Jesus at his death and resurrection is delivered to us in water, in baptism, in, in body and blood of the Holy Communion and in the Spirit-inspired Scriptures. You don't have to go up to get it. God brings it right down here to you. Right here, right now. There's this uh, great story about the Battle of the Nile. If you're a, a, a naval uh, historian, you might know about the Battle of the Nile. It was the British against the French, 1798. Now, and in 1798, uh, the Brits really needed a victory. You see, they had just lost the American colonies, so this is a huge battle for Britain. Horatio Nelson was the admiral who led the British into the battle on August the 1st, 1798, and the British completely annihilated the French Navy at the Battle of the Nile. So Lord Nelson, he dispatches this message to Britain's King George III, and in that message he told the king, victory, victory is not a large enough word to describe what has taken place. We, we rooted them, we annihilated them. Victory is not a large enough word to describe what has taken place. That's what John, that's what John is talking about here. Nike, finally, isn't a large enough word. Hyper Nike, Romans 8 verse 37, isn't a large enough word to describe what has taken place in Jesus Christ. We have victory, John says, over the world through faith, delivered in the means of grace. And nothing in all of God's creation can separate us from our victory in Christ Jesus. And this victory, this victory is so large, you can't finally explain it. This victory, who's, who's it for? Well, this victory is for you. It is for you. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, eternally. Amen. Amen.